filming going on here, just so everybody knows that if friends couldn't make it, they can watch on Ustream. Um, it is always the best part of being um, a professor at a university to see your PhD student be at this point in their career. It's so incredibly exciting. And it's especially doubly a million times over exciting when it's a super rock star. <laughs> and <laughs> Ruby has been um, just really flying through her program. Um, she was featured in this annual report of the School of Environment, Arts, and Society um, because she received uh, the Everglades Foundations for Everglades Scholarship um, to, well, understand how diatoms can be used to track uh, rates of saltwater intrusion relative to freshwater restoration activities in the Everglades. Um, that was so exciting for her to have received this award and she put it to great use and did a lot of incredible um, field work that ended up um, culminating in so far three publications that are already out in the literature. Um, always an incredible thing to see when reading a dissertation that three papers are already um, in press and published. Um, a fourth one came from her undergrad or her master's work at University of Southern Mississippi at the Gulf Coast Research Lab, um, where she was working on the um, algae and the productivity of algae growing on coral reefs. Um, and uh, in she did that work in like 2011 and 12, and then in 13 came to FIU, um, end of the PhD program, and has just been um, so active in every part of this program from leadership in the Florida Coastal Everglades LTR program um, to the ways in which she has really been just a really key player in our lab, and we're just so uh, excited to see her in this phase of her work. And um, it's important work, and it's really timely work that's uh, playing right into the ways in which we think about the future of the Everglades, um, and not just think about it, but actually act on the kinds of um, rapid changes that we're seeing, and, and with these little diatoms that respond so quickly to change, um, we can uh, use them to, to um, help make decisions about moving water more appropriately through South Florida and, and um, uh, for a brighter future of the Everglades. So I'm just so proud of the work that Vivi's um, done. She's been um, an incredibly independent worker um, over these years, um, particularly making incredible strides in um, different ways that you can analyze community data to pick up um, systemic changes in composition along gradients, and um, that's uh, really involves some um, um, delving deeply into the use of our programs and, and to be able to um, really engage in this most recent literature on, on understanding um, compositional uh, breaks and compositional change. And I've been just really impressed by that because it's a rare thing for us students to just delve into something that their major professors have um, no clue about. And so I've learned uh, so much from Vivi over these years and uh, just, again, really thrilled to, to be at this point. So um, take it away, Vivi, um, on your dissertation. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for the introduction. And thank you guys for all coming out today. I can't believe this day is finally here. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about my dissertation work where I was looking at benthic diatom communities in the Everglades and how they're responding to these changes, environmental, these changing environmental gradients caused by saltwater intrusion. Oh no. It's not working. Oh, there. Um, so, what are diatoms? Um, for those of you that are not familiar, these are um, unicellular algae that are unique in having a cell wall made of silica or glass. And these glass cell walls have this very um, elaborate ornamentation of pores, which allows exchange with the environment through that glass cell wall, and not only makes them very beautiful to look at, but also allows them to allows us to accurately um, identify them based on morphological features alone. So diatoms are 
um, a common tool in water quality assessment and ecosystem assessments because they respond very predictably and um, rapidly to small scale changes in the environment. And that environmental specificity makes it so that we often see unique assemblages that are associated with particular environments. So in the Everglades, we have a very well characterized endemic diatom um, community that live in these paraphyton mats. Um, these are calcareous microbial mats that are um, widespread, not just in the Everglades, but in um, other karstic freshwater wetlands throughout the Caribbean. And they provide um, a lot of different important ecological um, services, including primary production, carbon cycling, and nutrient cycling, as well as providing habitat to unique communities of microorganisms. So and here you can see that internal structure of these mats and some diatoms living in here. And the reason I was interested in studying these is because um, they're, they have been shown in the Everglades and in other ecosystems to be very um, sensitive to changing environmental gradients. So we can use them to assess um, how saltwater intrusion is going to be affecting the gradients that are um, the strongest drivers here in the Everglades, namely salinity and phosphorus. So to step back a little bit, why are, do we care about environmental gradients? Well, they are a very strong structuring force behind community organization patterns. And this is described by the species sorting model, which basically says that you have this regional species pool that undergoes um, random dispersal throughout the landscape where it encounters various environmental filters that then sort the species into these local communities based on their individual environmental tolerances as well as the local biotic interactions. Um, when environmental gradients are spatially structured, as is the case with elevational gradients or rocky intertidal habitats, we, also, we often see very clear habitat um, zonation patterns that can produce ecotones. And so the ecotones are basically these transitional areas with, um, that are characterized by rapid species turnover and um, the presence of species that are at their dis distributional limits from adjacent habitat types. So that makes the communities in the ecotone very sensitive to changing environmental conditions and um, make these areas um, good predictors of uh, climate change and other ecosystem perturbations. So the Everglades is a great example of a landscape with a spatially structured environmental gradient that produces habitat zonation with a distinct ecotone. Um, so up in the freshwater upstream reaches of this gradient, we have um, these characteristic um, karstic freshwater wetlands that are very low in P naturally. And as you move towards the coast, we get these coastal marshes with saltier water and higher phosphorus concentrations. And then between these two, there's the distinct ecotone, which we call the white zone here because it's clearly visible as a white band um, in satellite imagery. And then along this habitat zonation pattern, we also see changes in the types of paraphyton mats that occur. So at the freshwater end, we have these um, characteristic, calcareous, cohesive um, mats that, as you move towards the coast, um, are replaced by non-calcium carbonate precipitating mats such as organic filaments and uh, surficial biofilms. And as the physical um, structure of these mats changes, so does the species composition um, that's associated with the mats. However, in the Everglades, these gradients are changing due to saltwater intrusion. Um, in the Everglades, this is largely caused by reduced decades of reduced um, freshwater flows into southern marshes um, uh, due to hydrologic management practices, as well as rising sea levels. 
So the Everglades um, has a very low elevation relative to sea level rise and also has a forest limestone bedrock. So this makes it even more susceptible to saltwater intrusion, both over land and below ground. And um, as, as saltwater intrusion moves into these freshwater marshes and the ecotone, it's not only elevating salinity, but it's bringing in excess phosphorus as well. In the case of the low ground saltwater intrusion, we have a second source of um, phosphorus because as the salt water comes into contact with the limestone, it causes the phosphate that's adsorbed onto the calcium carbonate to become desorbed and then um, biologically available. So these um, changes in salinity and phosphorus gradients caused by saltwater intrusion are creating um, or are altering community organization patterns from the landscape scale um, down to the microorganism scale. At the landscape scale, we've already observed um, encroachment of coastal mangroves into previously freshwater habitats, and then um, also documented the migration of um, that white zone further inland with rising uh, or with with saltwater intrusion, and this is basically over a 50-year period. So the black is 1940, the red is 1994, and we can see a substantial movement over that 50-year period. With the micro um, organism scale, although we know they're very sensitive to salinity and phosphorus. We haven't really explicitly tested how these communities are going to be responding um, to the changing gradients associated with saltwater. So that's what I was interested in looking at. And so this conceptual figure kind of just summarizes the environmental and biological attractions that I was interested in looking at. I saw water on the top, and um, it affects both salinity and phosphorus by elevating their concentrations. And then salinity and phosphorus both, both directly affect purifying functional metrics like productivity and biomass and their nutrient concentrations, um, as well as directly affecting the individual species that are found within these maps um, based on their individual tolerances to these uh, drivers. Then there's also a bi-directional interaction between species composition and terrifying um, structure and function. So with elevated salinity and phosphorus, we often lose some structural engineer species. So these are the ones that are really responsible for creating and maintaining the structures of these mats. And as um, they disappear, then these mats also start to disappear. With the disappearance of these mats, we might also see the loss of species that um, are not necessarily structural engineers, but are just dependent on these micro ecosystems and the particular conditions provided by them um, to, to thrive. So basically, saltwater intrusion threatens these very important ecosystem um, components and microhabitats but also threatens um, the, uh, our endemic diatom populations in the Everglades. So my overarching question was how does parafighting um, respond to community, or uh, sorry, how does diatom community respond to changing salinity and phosphorus gradients? And this is important because as I showed you, saltwater intrusion is um, transforming these gradients and um, Parafitin and their diatoms are really sensitive tools to help us understand um, how that's happening and what changes we can expect. So I address this question at different scales, starting with the landscape scale or where I conducted um, a field survey and I looked at diatom community assembly patterns along natural salinity and phosphorus gradients in the field. Um, then I wanted to experimentally test those effects I did this um, through two mesocosm experiments. One was a field experiment where I looked at the effects of salinity only on both parafyton functional parameters and its um, community composition. 
And then the second mesocosm experiment was um, an ex situ experiment where I elevated both salinity and phosphorus to see how they affect paraphyton function and, um, and species composition individually and both together. And then in chapter four, I really zoomed in at the microscale by um, focusing on this one individual diatom species that is um, very abundant in these calcareous paraphyton mats to determine whether its abundance patterns are more closely control or, are more, or more strongly controlled by um, salinity and phosphorus directly, or if it's the um, the loss of uh, the availability of the paraphyton microhabitat that's more important to these guys. So before I get into the specifics, I want to go over some general methods that I used across all the um, all the studies. Basically, the first step is go out to the field or the mesocosms, get the paraphyton. For the mesocosm experiments, I measured paraphyton metabolism using the light and dark bottle method technique. And then when I brought these samples back to the lab, I basically stuck the paraphyton in a beaker with DI water and blended it to get a homogeneous slurry that I could then subsample for different analyses, such as um, biomass and nutrients chlorophyll A, and also the diatom communities. So the diatom subsamples were cleaned of any organic material, which left us with just those, um, those glass cell walls and their ornamentation, like I showed you in the first slide, that could then be mounted on microscope slides and um, looked at under the microscope. There I counted at least 500 valves, identified them to species, and then determined their relative abundances. So to analyze this community data, I um, use ordination methods a lot. Mostly I stuck with principal, co principal coordinates analysis and non-metric multidimensional scaling. But if you have questions about the specifics, I'll talk to you about them later. For now, I just want to show you um, what an ordination plot looks like in case you're not familiar with them because you're going to be seeing them a lot So I want you to be able to read them. Basically, this is just an example looking at microbial community um, as, or com Microbial community composition in oxidized versus reduced um, soils So the blue points represent samples that came from oxidized conditions red or samples that came from reduced so You see that they group very nicely into two clusters that um, that tells you that oxidized and reduced conditions have different microbial communities. You can also plot correlated environmental variables onto the ordination to determine um, the strength and direction of those environmental variables in driving um, the community separation between the two groups. And then you can test the significance of these um, groups by using Edison, which will give you a p-value so you know it's statistically significant. And then lastly, we want to know which diagnostic species um, occur in, in both of these groups. And we do that with indicator species analysis. I used um, Titan and Indy species in R, which again, I can tell you more about later if you're interested. So, um, for chapter one, I looked at the landscape scale um, patterns of diatom communities along natural salinity and phosphorus gradients and um, tested three hypotheses. First, I expected that the salinity and phosphorus gradients would exhibit um, spatial structure that, um, of increasing concentrations towards the coast and that these gradients drive community assembly patterns. I also expected to find spatial boundaries in these assemblages that would um, kind of uh, line up with the habitat zonation patterns we see in the field. So freshwater, ecotone, um, to coastal zones. And then thirdly, I expected to find very specific salinity and phosphorus thresholds that I could then use to identify diagnostic species along different conditions um, in the gradient. And this was done by sampling along a series of sampling along a series of seven transects that spanned that freshwater ecotone 
to coastal zone. And on each of these sites, I measured poor water conductivity and collected parapyton. And the parapyton uh, was brought back to the lab where I analyzed it for its total phosphorus concentration and the diatom community. The parapyton total phosphorus concentration was used as our proxy for total phosphorus in the environment. And there's a lot of literature out there saying that the um, parapyton total phosphorus is a better metric than measuring water column concentrations because it, any P that's put into this P limited system is so rapidly taken up, it's often undetectable. So it's very common for us to use parapyton um, phosphorus concentrations to determine um, loading in the environment. So then the first thing I wanted to look at is um, the spatial patterns of, um, of the environmental gradients. So conductivity is plotted at the top and then phosphorus gradient at the bottom. Both of these graphs have distance from coast on the secondary y-axis and then the, each individual transect is plotted in sequence from west to east at the bottom. And what I saw was um, the expected pattern of increasing conductivity for each transect um, as you get closer to the coast, but then also found that in general, conductivity increases as you move from western to eastern portions of the Everglades. The um, phosphorus gradients in the uh, westernmost transects exhibited that increased concentration towards the coast, as I had expected, but then we also saw this pattern of general decline as you moved from western to um, eastern transects. So we actually, so in the west to east direction, we have opposite patterns of um, salinity and phosphorus. Then I wanted to look for spatial patterns in the diatom communities, and I did this using an ordination method. Um, and what this showed me is that um, my sites clustered very nicely into three groups that I distinguished or designated as freshwater transitional or brackish based on um, the environmental vectors. So this basically represents the distance from coast gradient. It's pointing in the direction of freshwater, this freshwater group. And then the, the conductivity gradients pointing in this direction show that these groups are associated with higher conductivity. The phosphorus gradient also came out as significant in driving these um, groupings. However, it seems to have less of an effect than salinity and be um, more important in driving this variation within the transitional group. Let me go back to this. So from, from this ordination, although it shows us um, how my sites are um, clustering together, over the entire study area. I really wanted to know um, how the diatoms were assembled along individual transects. Because as I showed you before, those transects don't always exhibit the same kind of environmental gradients. So in order to do this, I took, um, I used the first axis of this ordination, which explains uh, the highest percentage of variation in community to similarity. And from that, determine where along each where along each transect the greatest um, shift in community composition occurred. So then I linked these together across the seven transects, and what we see is that this diatom inferred ecotone lines up very nicely with the location of the white zone. And then the next thing I wanted to do was look for environmental thresholds for different um, diatom assemblages. And I did this um, using Titan, which is Threshold Indicator Taxa Analysis. And this is really cool because it distinguishes between decreasing taxa and increasing taxa. So in the case of conductivity gradients, our declining taxa, the black dots, would represent freshwater species that whose abundances um, decline as concentrations get higher, and then the increasing taxa, the white dots, are brackish water species that start to come in when you reach a certain salinity threshold. So for um, for, condu for conductivity, we found that that 
freshwater assemblage threshold occurred at about one part per thousand, so you know, very small increase. And then um, start that freshwater assemblage became replaced by ravaged water assemblage about 12 parts per thousand. Um, similarly, for the phosphorus gradient, we saw oligotrophic species, which are the declining ones. They start to um, they start to fall away at about 80 micrograms per gram of phosphorus, and then at about three times that, you start seeing a eutrophic assemblage come um, and replace our, our endemic um, low P species. Um, this analysis also allows us to look at um, the change points and distribution of the individual indicator species that are driving those assemblage thresholds. So when you plot these, um, the assemblage thresholds on these, um, on these plots, you're able to see, okay, which species are really indicators of these freshwater conditions, which species are indicators of the brackish water, and then what species um, don't really care. So those transitional species. And the same for uh, phosphorus indicators. And it's, it's interesting that we found a lot more indicators of conductivity gradients than phosphorus gradients, which kind of suggests, again, like the ordination, that salinity is having a stronger effect in structuring these communities than phosphorus. To, uh, to summarize, I'm going to be using this conceptual figure at the end um, to keep everything consistent. Um, in this study, we looked at salinity and P, uh, and P gradients in the field and how they affect species community composition. And um, we were able to document the uh, spatial patterns in those two gradients, which is really important um, in order to predict how saltwater intrusion is going to change them. So we need to know some baselines of how these gradients are um, in space. And then we also found spatial boundaries and thresholds for salinity and phosphorus that can play um, that can be very helpful in um, guiding management decisions about mitigating saltwater intrusion. We also saw that salinity may be a stronger driver than phosphorus. This is also important information to know when um, managers are trying to decide how to. Um, uh, mitigate with freshwater restoration and um, other things. So then, um, because the salinity and phosphorus gradients in the field are confounded, we need, or I needed to do experimental tests to um, really tease apart the individual effects of salinity and phosphorus. In the first field experiment, I only looked at the effects of salinity on periphyton and um, I did this in a freshwater and a brackish water marsh because um, you can expect that these two areas are going to be experiencing saltwater intrusion at different times and at different magnitudes. So we wanted to see how these uh, different, or how the periphyton communities in these two habitats uh, may respond. So we expected that saltwater stress is going to reduce periphyton function, so like reduce productivity and maybe reduce nutrient uptake capacity as well as alter the species composition. I also expected that um, the diatom communities would be more sensitive to these changes than um, the functional periphyton metrics. And then thirdly, I expected that brackish water periphyton would be less responsive to the salt water treatment versus the fresh water um, So here's our fresh, here's our fresh water marsh and our brackish water marsh. These actually coincide with that um, trans transect from the first study that's furthest to the west. They're along that same uh, road. And at each of these sites we installed 12 chambers, 6 controls, and 6 salinity treatments. Um, at the freshwater site we elevated surface water salinity uh, above one about one part per thousand above ambient, whereas at the brackish water site, we achieved a two part per thousand elevation above ambient. Um, so these chambers were dosed monthly, and then immediately after the dosing, 
I went out there and if pyrophyton was present, I collected it and measured um, metabolism and then brought samples home for nutrient analyses and diatom um, composition. So the mean effects on saltwater addition um, for pyrophyton functional metrics are shown here. Um, this is an average over approximately a 13 month experimental period. And um, what I found was that as a freshwater marsh, um, the, uh, the addition of salinity significantly reduced both net ecosystem productivity and both primary productivity in parabite mats, had no effect on ecosystem respiration or on chlorophyll A, but we did see significant reductions in both total carbon, total nitrogen, and total phosphorus with added salt at the freshwater site. At the brackish water site, we didn't see any significant effect on any of the functional metrics that we measured. And then I looked at the community composition and immediately we see that our freshwater and brackish water marsh, uh, marshes have very distinct diatom communities. And then at the freshwater marsh, we saw that the addition of um, salinity really caused significant shifts in um, in the diatom communities. At the brackish water, um, we saw some evidence of a community shift, but this overlap between the two circles um, indicates that it wasn't as strong. So the circles are the controls and the triangles are the salt treatments. Say that. And then I did an anisim to uh, test the statistical significance of those separations and saw that um, at the freshwater site, the difference in community composition between treatments was significant, and that the addition of salt, so saltwater stress increases um, community dispersion. And at the brackish water site, even though the NMDS was a little bit overlapped, the, the treatment effects were significant. And so what this is showing us is that our um, you know, our, our small endemic diatom assemblages are becoming replaced by a more diverse coastal assemblage as they're exposed to um, saltwater intrusion. We also saw that with a one part per thousand increase in surface water, we started seeing um, some naturally uh, brackish water indicator species become established at the freshwater salinity tree. So showing the, the real, like the strong sensitivity of these organisms to small scale changes. And that actually supports the one part per thousand threshold that we found in that field experiment for freshwater bats. So in this study, we looked at, or I looked at salinity um, only effects on both parabite function and species composition. I found that um, both parabitin and diatoms from freshwater communities are very sensitive to small increases in salinity. Um, and that the brackish water marshes were more resilient, which is not surprising given that these, um, that, that side is closer to the coast and therefore experiences natural fluctuations in salinity. So it's probably more adapted to um, seeing a two part per thousand increase. We also, um, the results also suggest that there is functional redundancy in the um, parafighting communities, especially because at the brackish water site, we didn't see any um, function, we didn't see any effects of salt water on the functional metrics of parafighting, but we did see significant shifts in the community. So we have different communities coming in, but they're still performing the same functions. Then the, um, the second mesocosm experiment was conducted at a research facility where we, where we um, tested the individual and combined effects of elevated phosphorus on parabitin and its diatoms. The first hypothesis is the same um, from the field where salt stress is expected to reduce parabitin functions and then alter species composition. Um, I also expected that with elevated phosphorus, we would see enhanced productivity that might offset the salt stress. And then again, compositional responses were expected to be more sensitive to both the salinity of phosphorus changes compared to the uh, parabitin uh, parameters. 
So here we collected um, 24 cores from a, a freshwater site in the Everglades, brought them back to this research um, facility in Key Largo, and assigned them to one of four treatments. They re either received a freshwater only, freshwater plus pea, saltwater only, or saltwater plus pea. And um, on average, our treatments um, elevated salinity in the in both salinity treatments eight part per thousand above what was um, above the concentrations in the freshwater treatments and then surface water TDP um, was doubled between the fresh and pea and the fresh only and then um, almost four times greater in the salt plus phosphorus compared to the salt And the first thing I noticed is that even though those water column total phosphorus measurements were a little bit um, not really showing the, the, the effect of the continuous dosing of phosphate that we were giving these mats, um, we did see that the paraphyton reflected our treatments. So both the freshwater plus P and the saltwater plus P um, had higher total phosphorus concentrations in the paraphyton mat. Even though between freshwater and freshwater plus P, we didn't see um, increased phosphorus in the surface water here. So that's telling you these mats are taking it up before we're even able to see it in the water. Um, I also saw that phosphorus tended to increase chlorophyll concentrations in these mats, although um, that was not significant. Um, as as I saw in the field experiment, here I also saw that salinity significantly reduces paraphyton total carbon content, um, but while P has no effect on it. Similarly, ash free dry, ash -free dry mass, so biomass accumulation rates of paraphyton tended to be low with salinity, but were not significant. So again, we're seeing a lot of non-significant effects on these paraphyton metrics. Um, as for the metabolism data, salinity did not affect paraphyton metabolism, um, although you can see that in the salinity treatments um, there, were, there was lower ecosystem respiration compared to the freshwater and lower GPP in the salt compared to freshwater, and the, the error bars are just borderline there, so, but they didn't come out as significant which we did see a significant decline in these parameters in the field. Um, we did see that P increases both gross primary productivity and net ecosystem productivity in salt-treated paraphyton only. So this is getting at um, that hypothesis about phosphorus potentially um, uh, offsetting salt stress. When we looked at the diatom communities, we see again that salt is uh, a very strong driver of community changes. So the, the freshwater uh, treatments are in blue and the brackish water treatments are in green. Um, the NSM shows that there is a significant difference between these two clusters. But then when we look at um, the effects of adding P to freshwater mats, we don't see a significant However, when we add phosphorus to salt-treated mats, we do see significant community composition shifts. So to recap, in this study we looked at both salinity and phosphorus effects on paraphyton functions in species composition. Again, here we, um, it, the results suggest functional redundancy because we're not seeing a lot of significant effects on those paraphyton functional metrics and yet we're still seeing significant shifts in um, the diatom communities. Also, um, the results here suggest that salinity may be a stronger driver of diatom severed shifts in phosphorus. This is a conclusion that we made from the transect study as well. And also that phosphorus may offset the salt stress. Okay, so in chapter four, we really zoomed in to look at the response of one of the most abundant um, and endemic diatom species from calcareous paraphyton mats. 
And Cyanema evergladianum is um, very abundant in these mats, not just in the Everglades, but in other parts of wetlands throughout the Caribbean basin. And it's um, usually associated with freshwater, low peak conditions typical of karstic wetlands. But here I wanted to determine whether um, abundance patterns in this species was uh, more strongly driven by the availability of paraphyte and microhabitat versus um, directly, directly to salinity and phosphorus. So to do this, I used populations of Entinema evergladianum from three karstic wetlands, including the Everglades. So that Everglades data came from my transect survey, and the data from Mexico and Belize came from um, Joe, Joseph Lucky and, um, and Geyser's um, surveys out there. Um, and here I wanted to, tra to test whether abundance patterns are more strongly driven by salinity and phosphorus or by the availability of paraphyte and microhabitat. And then I also wanted to see if those controls were consistent across these three geographically separated but similar karstic wetlands. And thirdly, if there were differences, um, did, were they reflected in the morphology of the species? So what I found was um, by doing multiple, um, multiple linear regressions, I determined which um, driver was most strongly controlling abundance. And when I performed this on the regional data set, I found that overall, um, paraphyton microhabitat seems to be the strongest driver at the regional scale. However, when we look at these, um, uh, these uh, the, the partial regression plot, sorry. Um, we can see like substantial variability in this relationship here when we combine all three populations. And that's because the individual populations are not responding um, in the same ways to the different drivers. In the Everglades and Belize, we see that um, ash-free dry mass, so microhabitat micro availability are really the strongest controls on the species abundance. Whereas in um, the Yucatan, we found conductivity to be most strongly controlling abundance patterns in the species. Now whether this is because ecotypic differentiation has occurred in this wetland causing it to respond differently, or because this wetland actually has a very different conductivity gradient than Belize and Everglades um, needs to be determined. But um, I think it's, it's mostly a difference in gradient length because when I looked at morphological features among the three populations, I didn't see um, any significant differences. So in this NMDS, um, I would have expected that that Yucatan population would have maybe separated it on its own, showing us that um, uh, there are morphological features associated with the ecological differences in that population, but that was not the case. So why does this matter? So this research is showing the importance of this um, microhabitat and its very unique conditions to certain endemic diatoms of the Everglades. So you lose these mats and you are going to lose some of the um, species that are only found in these environments. The fact that they were not responding um, consistently to the same controls across different wetlands kind of highlights the fact that when you're developing indicator species, it's really important to calibrate them to the context of individual wetlands before you can apply them on a regional scale. And, um, and that's kind of like uh, supported by this not finding morphological differences because um, if you don't have morphological differences to differentiate between ecotypes and you're trying to apply an indicator on a regional scale, it's going to be very difficult to know why it's not to identify that this population is going to respond in a different way. So I know I've given you a lot of information to digest, but the take home message is that Saltwater intrusion is occurring in the Everglades. Um, so you need freshwater restoration in order to mitigate saltwater intrusion. Um, but 
the, the, the research mainly shows that these parabyte communities and their diatoms are super, super sensitive to the um, transformations in the salinity and phosphorus gradients that are being caused by saltwater intrusion. So these guys respond super quickly in the order of hours to days, while plant communities may take months to years to show quantitative um, changes, and at the landscape scale, it can be decades before we see them. So these communities really provide a sensitive tool to um, kind of guide management practices on how we can mitigate saltwater. So with that, I would like to thank um, my committee members who have been super supportive and couldn't have done it without them. All the wonderful people that helped me with field work and in the lab. Special shout out to Franco, who I'm always asking to help me identify species. Um, and um, all the funding agencies that made this work possible, including FCE LTER program through NSF, the South Florida Water Management District, FIU for awarding me the dissertation year fellowship and the Everglades Foundation for um, for awarding me the four Everglades scholarship. And that is it. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Vivi. Um, so at this point, we'll um, open the room for questions um, from the uh, general audience here and I'll ask the folks who are on the committee to hold their questions until uh, after um, the meeting talks to y'all um, in the general audience. Shelby. So on the NMDS plots for the salinity and phosphorus experiment, uh -huh. when you plot against phosphorus, do you use matte phosphorus or the tree level of phosphorus? Um, that's based on um, parabyte phosphorus. Okay. Yeah. I had the same question about this actually. Yeah. So um, you were saying that phosphorus might offset some of the salt stress mm -hmm. and you saw this shift between adding salt and then within the salt added phosphorus. Mm -hmm. So was it that the the phosphorus was keeping the MAC community from shifting towards the more salt tolerant, or did it form its own new community that was able to use both, or that was able adapted to both salt and the phosphorus? So it, yeah. from this, it, it, looked, uh, it looks like it's forming its own. So there's a different community that's uh, brackish <coughs> and loves phosphorus, whereas there's this other community that just likes salinity condition. And you had another part to your question. Oh, I, I was just wondering, like, if if salt water and phosphorus come in at the same time, is that, like, you saw that, at least when you measured it, net ecosystem production was higher than just under natural conditions. Yeah. So what what do you what's your just your thoughts so on I that? So I think with salt water that's coming in that brings in excess phosphorus, which isn't always the case, like I showed you in those um, salinity and phosphorus spatial mm -hmm. gradients, they're not always correlated. In so, but in the cases of like the western transects where salinity and phosphorus um, are going to be elevated with uh, saltwater intrusion, we can expect to see a distinct community that might look like this salt peak. But in areas where phosphorus is not really coming in so much with saltwater intrusion and it's mostly just the effects of salt, then we'll see a different community here. So it's really important to get these diagnostic species right so we know like um, how to use them and apply them to different salt water intrusion situations. Thanks. Great job, Dee. Um, so what do you think is your strongest um, finding and where do you think there's more to do? So I um, personally am really like happy with the results of the transact surveys because I think that that was the foundation for everything else and it really shows that these diatoms are tracking the habitat donation in the Everglades. And then I was able to actually provide um, thresholds for different communities that's going to be super important when um, we're trying to make management decisions about how to, you know, how much fresh water to bring in or not. Um, so, I, yeah. Um, things I can use other work. Um, I think 
I think teasing apart the salinity and phosphorus effects needs more work. Like this is definitely a starting point, but um, I think to really get at what's doing what to the diatom communities, we need to maybe another experimental study. Oh, also those transects need to be um, made longer. <laughs> So we can really capture better, like, the spatial gradient in the diatoms. So I would definitely do that. So this is really interesting. Like, you have the, so you identified every diatom in that you had in there. So, <coughs> so potentially then you could, someone could get a core and say you could target when a certain threshold of salt water came in. Which would be, would be yeah. A idea. Would you assume that there wouldn't be... Uh, new species that you would run into, or how how would you deal with with that? Uh, um, new species like in the core. Yeah, or like, like different like <laughs> ones that aren't like over time is the assemblage. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know too much about like paleo work, yeah. but I yeah I would imagine that if, if you took a core, you're gonna find species in there that maybe are not like present in current day just because they go back like you know millions of years. Um, but still, you could use the, the assemblages that we have like now to kind of, as a, like a calibration set to determine um, what those other communities and the cores, what the, what the environmental conditions were at different times along the cores, depending on what the diatoms you found there. I mean, it would be interesting in like in the past hundred years, I don't know if anyone's done this, to be yeah. like, when did it actually get solved here? Well, I mean, um, Emily Nodine did, um, she did paleo work, not here in the, in the southeastern Everglades, she was looking like on the Gulf, she was doing cores, right? Yeah, so um, she has some of that data and, and was able to see like when, you know, like historical saltwater intrusion um, in that part of the Everglades. Good question? Okay, this is something I always ask. Uh, I'm Dale. Um, so, if, if you want to translate this information, so I guess you translated this information in a good way to get money from the district, right? So, <laughs> so because that, well, yes, because like that, right? that's the problem that is all of us. But, um, but my question is, just say if you're if you're giving a talk to stakeholders, you know, to talk about best management practices for for what you're doing, mm -hmm. um, stakeholders being you know uh, a, a company or or whatnot, or just people that are around, how would you tell them that this is important for them to give? or care about what they're, the, these little things. And yeah. um, also, are the, do you see a difference in other microalgae, um, as potential indicator, soft body algae, than just diatom? So it's, it's two different questions mm -hmm. together, but I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, so for like the, the way I would respond to stakeholders is basically just starting with the fact that salt water intrusion is not just an ecological problem, it's a social problem. It affects um, you know, business owners, homeowners, any citizen that lives here because it's affecting our um, drinking water. So mitigating salt water intrusion by whatever measures is super important and these communities just happen to be really sensitive at picking those things up so they're, they're going to really tell us like the lower thresholds and um, show us things, you know, changes before we're going to see them directly in the landscape. And then for your second question, it, oh, the, it, yeah. the soft algae. Yeah. Um, I actually have so I samples for soft algae. They, I have them in the freezer uh, waiting, and I, I would love to look at them because cyanobacteria are a huge part of these mats. Mm -hmm. Like they, they really, they're the ones that precipitate the calcium carbonate, kind of form the backbone. Um, and so, yeah, looking at like those three different algal groups together, I think would make this work. Stronger. So you think it's, it's pulling everything together will make it stronger, yeah. to make your, your answer stronger? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? You can I? I have oh. A, so an idea. So if these brackish mats are more resilient to salinity and the effects of phosphorus are lower, crazy scientists said, yeah, can you like ask the uh, to an assisted migration of peripheral mass adapted to higher salinity and phosphorus towards the more freshwater sites. Um, Wait, I don't really understand. Well, you cannot um, help the 
freshwater areas that are getting saltier but mm -hmm. gradually to transition into those more estuarine brackish sites by planting mats in them. Oh, I've yeah. wanted to do transplant experiments like <laughs> for a while. Like I think that would be really helpful to see if you took mats from brackish water marsh and then put them in the fresh water and took the calcareous one and put them in the brackish water. I think that would be a really good way. But what about from a management point of view? Crazy. Um, to do a transplant <laughs> experiment is it crazy? I mean, no, no. You do the experiment to, to see whether it might work. That uh, I don't know somehow. That they go, oh, you're you, saying you, like it. You counter captive invasion with a little bit of extra phosphorus due to more fresh water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Here's some food on the way 